you'd like to put that in there, you can. The reading today is from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. God's word for God's people. And our hearts hear and our lives, lives respond. We do have a special guest today, preaching today, and he's... It's actually just me. It's actually just... That <laughs> is a special guest. And in fact, Brandon has been doing pre, some guest preaching at some other churches recently, and I said, you know what, it's been too long since you preach for us. So please come and preach for us. And it is my birthday. He said, I want to preach on my birthday. So yeah, I think everyone always wants to know, what do I want to do yes. on my birthday? Are you the... <laughs> I don't even know how to react to that. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, are you the type of people who take your birthdays off of work? Who does that? Are you... You are? You are? Anybody else? I never understood that. When people find out... That's the thing. You get free lunch. You get treated well. Nobody else is taking your birthday off. What are you doing? Sitting at home watching Maury? I don't understand. So, um, good morning. How is everybody? Golly. This, what is, I feel like this is the 100th day of July. Uh, my life has been insane. I know some of you know some of the things that have been going on in my life, some of the things that have been going on with my family. It is just good to be here. Um, it's good to be up here. I li you know me, I like to talk. I don't like to shut up a whole lot, but, um, but mostly just being here with you all, period. The weeks that I've been able to be here, have, they're just heartwarming. They're restorative. I don't like not being here, <laughs> but the fact, I'm, I hate Facebook so much, and I think you guys know that, but I keep it around to stay in contact with people. Thank you for reaching out, and everybody's been so helpful. Um, some of you know that I lost my dad in July, so that was a big deal. Um, my mom, God, I, always, I want to get up here one time and like just laugh the whole time and never cry. It's just been a lot. It's been nuts. So it's, it's, uh, there's been a lot going on with my mother and then my brother's in-laws, their house flooded during the hurricane. And that was a whole ordeal. And right after that, they realized the house was going to have to go through all these renovations and stuff. And at the same time, his father-in-law also decided that he didn't want to live anymore. And he decided to take himself off of any, any hospital care. And he's, he passed away um, last week. And so it's just been, it's been a lot. It's been crazy. And I keep telling everybody, I'm like, this is the longest July of my life. Like, when does this end? That's why I'm surprised it's my birthday. Um, but man, it is just good to be here. That is, I don't want to say that's all in the past and it's all behind us. But I feel like my family is just on the cusp of starting to be able to breathe again. And it's so good. Um, so if the message sucks today, that's cool. <laughs> I've been running around taking, putting out little fires all over the place. Um, but I have missed you. I've missed you a lot. All right, we're going to dive into this. This is a real short scripture, right? A, a real small piece. We're dealing with only about five verses in total, and it's pretty. it seems pretty straightforward. As she read that uh, scripture today, I think basically we get to the end of that, and we're like, got it, Jesus. That's, it's, pretty, it's pretty straightforward. There's, I named this, uh, this sermon Mirror, Mirror, which you'll see I immediately will run away from that imagery. Uh, <laughs> but it's fun because I, have, you ever, have you ever been in a situation where someone has asked you or if you've uh, asked someone else, do you hear yourself? And I know we see it sometimes on Facebook and we, we, we are wondering like the way people are responding to each other. Like, do you, are you reading back before you hit send? Do you 
Hear yourself. Has anyone ever asked you that before? You guys are liars. Has anyone ever asked you? You guys know I want some interaction in here. Has anyone ever asked you that before? Do you hear yourself? Because they, I mean, they have with me. And, I'm, and we've all been in scenarios also where we're talking to someone and we're like, I don't think they hear themselves. But it's a little bit more demeaning to ask somebody, do you hear yourself? Than it is to just tell them they're wrong. And the interesting thing is most of us actually ever, never really do hear ourselves. We hear what we think we sound like, and we think what our tone sounds like. We think we know how we're being taken. We think that the argument we're making makes total sense, and it probably does only in your head. But if someone was able to say it back to you, and the problem is a lot of times when you finally tell someone what they sound like, you actually don't sound like them when you say it back to them. You kind of put on a voice when you say it like, Oh yeah, is that what you think? You think this and this? Like, as if that's how the person actually said it, right? If you, we always over caricaturize one another and at some point we don't get to even hear ourselves back from the people who are trying to probably help us. Do you hear yourself? I love it. I feel like every time I, I get up here I have like a question and that's the question today is, do we hear ourselves? Do you hear what you're saying when you say it? What is what is coming out of your mouth. There's actually a, a psychological phenomenon that describes some of this for some of us that have actually heard ourselves before. Have you ever heard your voice on a recording and went, Ugh. and what do you say? Horrible. That's what I sound like? And what do all your friends say? Like, yeah, that's you. And you're like, why are you friends with me if that's what I sound like? Why do you hang out with me? That, that psychological phenomenon where you hear your voice, it's two things. It's one, you don't think that's actually what you sound like. And sometimes you don't even recognize your own voice. And it's called voice confrontation. It's when you're literally, and this is, this is rare. This is, you got to think back when Jesus is having this conversation, they weren't recording themselves and hearing themselves back. The only way you could hear yourself back was through community. The only way you could hear yourself back is when someone finally went, hey, 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 hey. Can I say back to you what you just said so you can hear it? Have you ever heard yourself on a recording and hated it? Yes. Okay. How often do you hear yourself back on recordings? Probably... Probably a little, maybe more so than we used to. We, we have cell phones now. We record things all the time. I, was re I just recorded something yesterday. Me and my mom were out on the golf cart riding around, and I videoed all these turkeys out off their property. And my mom's talking in the background, and I was like, should I post the video without her voice? Because if she watches it later, she's going to be like, why did you post that? I sound so crazy. Like, I know we get it. Like, we hear our voices more than we used to, and I have heard my voice more than most people. More than most people. I was in bands for years, and that's, that's cool, but we, re we recorded our songs. And I have to listen back to, one, the way I sing, what I sound like, what I'm writing, and my melodies, and I am the worst about it, because just like a lot of you, I hear it back. And every, my problem is everyone goes, hey, job well done, this is great. And I can't handled that. I've listened back to myself preaching. I've listened back to myself giving talks at this, that, maybe a toast, tons of music, right? All these different, different ways that I've heard myself back, uh, even to the point where I've been Jesus in a play or two, obviously. <laughs> the right skin tone for Jesus. Uh, <laughs> I had a guy actually come up to me one time. He was the guy that kind of like did all the, the performance arts at, our, at the church. And he, he looked at me just like this. And I was like, can I help you? And then he walks over. I'm not kidding. Talk about trauma. He walks over and he starts grabbing my love handles. And I was like, can we talk first? Like, what's happening? And he goes, you think, would you want to play Jesus? And I was like, were you checking to see if I'd be okay with my shirt off? Like, and he was. Uh, so I've been Jesus and I've had to watch myself back on video play Jesus himself. I've also gone the other way and played literal Satan and had to watch that back. So I've heard myself recorded a bunch of times. Even one time I was in a movie and this is ridiculous. And I was the main, I was, I've never told a lot of people this because you won't find it and don't look for it. But I had to, I played like the lead role of a missionary. It is 
terrible. I was like, I'm probably a pretty good actor. And I watched it back. I was like, no one should see this. This should not be entered in the festival. This should just be burned. Like, so I've heard myself back a lot. And I critique myself to the point of oblivion. I, even if someone's like, hey, if I watch back today's sermon later this week, and a lot of times I do, just, but that's probably just so I can critique myself and be like, oh, this is where you messed up. And someone after today might say, hey, that was a really good sermon that really spoke to me. That's awesome. In my head, I'm like, mm -hmm. I know all the parts where I messed up. I know all the parts where I stumbled over my words. I totally missed a point to the point where I can't even take the compliment. I've changed a lot. I've, I had to change a lot because I, I realized I was kind of upsetting people at some point where they're trying to tell you you've done a good job. So I've kind of swung the other way of the guy that we have in this story who's really impressed with himself for the sake of himself. And I wonder, not so much my performance when I'm sometimes on stage. Of course, this isn't how I talk all the time, right? And when I listen back to myself singing, I don't sing everywhere I go, which would just be beautiful and Snow White, but I don't do that. And then even when I'm approached about it, and I'm, I listen back to myself, it's like, yes, I hear myself, I know how I can be better, and that sounds like a good thing, but I can't even take a compliment. And I wonder if someone in that moment could ask me, do you hear yourself? Do you hear yourself? You're not very kind to yourself. Do you hear yourself? And I have a little bit started to understand that, like, hey, man, I need to, I need to calm on this. Starting to realize the places that we do hear ourselves, and sometimes I'm learning to catch it, especially right now, being around my mom a lot more uh, than I have in the past, and realizing the little things that I've picked up from her. And I've always thought I was a little bit more like my dad than I was my mom in certain ways, but she says things, and I'm like, ooh, I say that. I say that. And it's almost like I'm getting a mirror held up in front of me. Be like, hey, that's where you get it from. And I have a six-year-old son, which you know and love. And he's perfect, except for when he does things that I go, ooh, he got that from me. <laughs> and I get a mirror held up from the other side going, hey, this is what you're reflecting into the world. You've been reflected on and you are also reflecting to someone else. And whether or not I've ever heard my own voice recorded within my community, I can find out where I've gotten certain traits and where I'm passing them along. There's always a mirror being held up in front of us because I even have, I, I've kind of gotten rid of it now, but I used to have this laugh where I would go, ha, and I'd throw my head back. And I realized one day I was like, when did I start doing that? I got it from my buddy, Matt. He does it because I'm mirroring him. I was like, that's fun. That's cool. I guess my brain was like, do that. That's neat. People will like you. And I was like, ha. <laughs> We're always mirroring one another back to each other, whether we know it or not. And we're picking up on little things, but we don't always hear our voice, own voice actually recorded. But can we see how we're affecting those around us and how we're allowing them to affect us as well? I know, only five verses. <laughs> but that's because Jesus is always saying more than we think he's saying. Jesus is always digging in a little deeper than we think he is. He, Jesus chooses his words very intentionally. And I will say it every, probably every time you ever give me the chance to speak. And I am very grateful for the chances that you give me. Context is so important here. Because we read it and we're like, okay, here's a quick little story. Two guys go into the temple. This is what happens when they came out. We already probably knew what was going to happen before the end. Jesus goes, this guy's actually the winner. Ding, ding, ding. But here's the thing, this isn't a true story. This is a parable. So what's important here is the parable, but what's, who's the parable for? If you have in your bulletin today, you have the scriptures, go ahead and pull them out. Go ahead and pull them out. I'm not going to make you take notes necessarily, but if you also look in front of you, there should be a pencil. Have us, we're going to underline a couple of things. Because I feel like this message today is actually pretty important because the intentionality of every word Jesus uses and who he's talking to really matters. Pretty straightforward scripture. Probably could have called it from the beginning. But let's remember one thing. Who is Jesus talking to? We know what he's talking about. That's the part of the story that seems like the meat. But maybe the most important thing, who is he talking 
2. He's talking, what does it say right here? I'm going to go ahead and read it. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. That's who he's talking to. The who of the story is the people that Jesus is addressing. People who thought of themselves as righteous. He is, look, this, these aren't the people made up for the story. These are the people he's sitting in front of, and it's the reason he makes up and tells a story. Because he's trying to do what? He's trying to reflect something back to the people that he's saying it to. He's not just willy-nilly telling a story that people are going to go, that seems pretty wise, Jesus. I'll save that for the people who need it. He's talking to the people who need it. He says he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men, now we're in the story, the story Jesus is making up. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing where? By himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Verse 9, I want you to go ahead and I want you to underline a couple things so we understand who Jesus is talking to. Is this so that you don't forget. I kind of want you to take this home. And go ahead and maybe even tape it to your mirror this afternoon. I don't usually do that. That seems a little homeworky. Under, under, underscore or underline these words. Trusted themselves righteous. There should be a pencil in front of you. Trusted themselves righteous. People who already came to the came to the story thinking, thinking that they were right and good and just. But we'll learn what some of those words actually mean here in the future. In verse 10, the question isn't who's the story being told to, it's who is in the story. And this is where it gets important because we don't have context for who these people are. These people don't really exist in our world anymore. We could probably pick out who, who would be a good analog if we could figure out who today makes up a Pharisee and who was a tax collector. But here are the two people in the story that Jesus is telling. One is a Pharisee and the other is a tax collector. What's a Pharisee? Do we even know? We kind of have, we kind of have some ideas. We, I think a lot of times, and I've said this in the past, probably even in here, we think the Pharisees are the bad guys, right? The Pharisees are the bad guys, but then we have a tax collector. We're like, well, was that a bad guy too? Because it's 2022, and I think the tax collectors are the bad guys. So it's like, do we have two bad guys? What do we have in this story? We have a Pharisee and a tax collector. Pharisees are not the bad guys. A lot of interactions Jesus has with the Pharisees, it seems like by the end of the story, he's making it seem like someone's a bad guy and someone's a good guy. But this is Jesus we're talking about. This is Jesus. This is the man, the God of the gospel, the good news. He doesn't make enemies. Jesus talks about enemy love. There is not a bad guy in this story. There's two men. That's what he says. One a Pharisee, one a tax collector. Pharisees? Pharisees are the religious leaders of the day. They're the good guys. They are maybe in fact righteous. They might even be good. They might not be bad at all. The other part is a tax collector. These kind of are the bad guys. Tax collectors in Jesus' day, and everybody he was talking to would have known this, were defectors from the faith that sided with Rome. When Jesus is on the earth in these stories, Jesus lives in a Roman-occupied city. They are the oppressed people. And tax collectors were Jews that defected to Rome. And now they collect taxes for Rome. 
And we could say, well, there's got to have been some tax collectors that weren't Jewish, that didn't defect, and they were, in fact, Roman. How do you know that this one was one of the Jews who defected? Because he went into the temple. <laughs> it's right there. It's all right there. So our tax collector should be our bad guy in this story. Our Pharisee should be our good guy. That's why the story is even crazier to the people that he's telling. We come with a preconceived notion that like, oh, I saw the word Pharisee. I know where this is going. The people that he would have first been telling this would not have caught that. They'd have been like, oh, a freaking tax collector? Woo! He's about to call out a tax collector because we know the Pharisees are the good guys. They're the keepers of the law. They're the keepers of the religious law. Now, what did they do in the story? And I'll probably have you underline a couple things here in verse 11. If we look back at verse 9, it says what? It says, some of those who trusted in themselves. So Jesus is obviously making a comparison pretty, pretty much right off the bat. That the people who he's telling are more represented by the Pharisees. And they probably thought that that was awesome. They were like, oh. He's talking about us, the good, righteous people, because these people already were coming to the story thinking that they were, in fact, righteous. It says, the Pharisee standing by himself, underline standing by himself. Standing by himself. This doesn't mean that he's off in a corner. It means that he is standing by his own strength. It means that he's standing by his own righteousness. He doesn't need anything from anyone. He doesn't want anything from anyone because as we keep reading, we'll see he doesn't think he needs anything anyway. It says that he's standing by himself. But what does he do? He, he has his prayer, kind of like how we talked with the kids today, was a prayer of what? Of thanksgiving. It sounds awesome. And today, when Sean was asking us, what are the things that we are thankful for? What were the things that we, what, that we said that we were thankful for? They were things that came from outside of ourselves. But this is a man who thinks he's standing just by his own strength. That's why it says in the first, the first verse, those who were trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And then we immediately mirror the first man, the Pharisee, the good guy, as someone standing by himself and giving a prayer of thanks. But what does he do immediately? Here's his thanksgiving, and, and here's, here's what I want to do. I want to be very careful because what, what I'm about to do, I, I, I need to be careful to also not over caricaturize this guy the way that we typically would. Because what I want to do is read his words like this. God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people. But that's a disservice because that's probably not what he sounds like. So if Jesus is telling this story to people that he's trying to make them think that they're this person, do you think he would mock them? Or do you think they would immediately go, eh, not listening to Jesus. He's, already, he's just mocking this guy. He's making a fool of him. He says it like this, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. It's a righteous prayer. It's a prayer of being aware of the fact that you're right. You're just. It's not necessarily a bad prayer. But here's the problem. He immediately then doesn't make it about the things that he is. He then turns it against someone else. In verse 12, it says this. It says, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. He starts talking more. Sorry, sorry, I did miss a part. I told you I would. He goes immediately from, I thank you for the things that I am. But then he what? Before the end of that verse, he said, or even like who? This tax collector. He's no longer talking about people that are on the outside. He's inside the temple with this other person. And that's the part where you really want to cake it on where you feel like he goes and this tax collector <laughs> like, as if he's being dramatic but what if he's being in earnest i'm thankful god that i'm not even like a tax collector that i've given myself over to you i'm thankful that i never defected 
but he's turning it on someone else instead of making about his personal transformation, his personal journey. In verse 12, it says this, he goes back to himself, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all my income. I did it. I did it on accident. Oh my God, did you catch that? I didn't even do that on purpose. Let's try it again. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all my income. It's hard, isn't it? That really was an accident. <laughs> I did not do that on purpose. The Pharisee gets two verses. We, I mean, we gave him two verses. He says a whole lot more. He seems to have a whole lot more to say, but it's pretty inward focused, except for in the middle where he points it at someone else, even to make himself feel better. But it, maybe he's not wrong about all of it. In 13, the tax collector begins, right? It says this, but the tax collector standing far off. Listen, that's going to sound like it's the exact same thing because it says that the Pharisee was standing by himself and that the tax collector was standing far off. You're like, so also by himself? No, because what, what does he do? It sounds like he's hiding. It sounds like he thinks he's not worthy. It's almost like he's more aware of himself. The tax, or the, excuse me, the Pharisee not necessarily being wrong about himself, but not very self-aware. Is it that boring? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. Right at the end of a phrase, too. <gasps> But it says the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his head. Not only is he hiding his body, he's hiding his face. It, said that he, it says he won't even look up into the heavens. His prayer is humble. His prayer is very, very self-aware. He knows who he is. He has, there's no thought in his head that he's a defector. Or excuse me, that he's not a defector. He knows what he's done. But we don't know. This is a, this is a made-up story, but Jesus is, I think, a smart enough guy to be like, hey, these people have lives, and they've probably done things that they've needed to do. Have you ever seen someone do something that maybe you thought was bad or wrong, but you didn't know why they did it? And then maybe a few years later, when you found out why they did what they did, you're like, that was the best thing they could have done for their family. We don't know who this tax collector is, but it sounds like the tax collector knows who he is. And he's very aware, because what does he say? He says that he hides his head, he beats his chest and says what? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's his whole prayer. The other man, we are talking about what he has to say, and the tax collector, we're talking about his posture. It says one stands by, him, stands by himself, right? And then it goes into all the words that he's got to say about himself. The tax collector instead hides himself and says very, very, very few words. What does he say? God, be merciful on me, a sinner. And why is Jesus telling this story? Because I, I think we, except, especially me, I was raised with this idea that every time I walked into the church, I had to feel bad and recognize that I was a sinner. And eventually at the altar call, once the pastor gives a long two-hour emotional message and the band is amazing and you start crying, you should go to the altar and be like, I'm so sorry. And that's how stuff like this would have been, would have been used. And that, that's not what's happening. Jesus is always trying to reiterate the gospel message of what? What is the first thing Jesus ever preached? It says that he started preaching what? Repent. I'll come back to that point every time. Because repentance is more beautiful than we think it is. Repentance doesn't just mean being aware of something bad you did and feeling really awful about it and being sad and crying. No, repentance means change. Repentance is not just awareness. It's doing something about the awareness. He walks into where? The temple. And says what? Forgive me, a sinner. I don't want to have to do this. 
I don't want to be this way. I want to change. The Pharisee says what? I'm so thankful I am who I am. I'm so thankful I am this way. Why would I change? Look at me. I'm not like that guy. And yes, I hear myself. I know what I'm doing with his voice. And then the tax collector, knowing who he is, walks in and goes, I don't know what to do. Forgive me. I don't even want to be seen here. I'm not, because I'm technically not even welcome here. How do I know I'm not welcome here? Because that guy prayed first and he's thankful he's not me. In verse 14, Jesus has a little bit of a resolve to the story. He says what? I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. What does he say first? He says, this man. Right after he gives the quick little prayer from the tax collector, he says, this man is justified. And what does that mean? Because I understand what you're saying, Jesus, but technically, the only one really acting just is the Pharisee. The Pharisee, do you hear what this guy does? He gives his income away. He fasts twice a week. He's not like the tax collector. He's not an adulterer. He's not a thief or a rogue, which would probably still be a stab at the tax collector. He's the justified one, right? How does Jesus turn this story? You and I were expecting this end. The people sitting there, just remember, they end up killing Jesus. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember that part of the story. Me and you are sitting here going, how could they kill a man who says such beautiful things? And they're like, because that's not beautiful. Did you hear what he just said? He's saying the tax collector walked out justified over the good guy. What? Does Jesus not understand what a tax collector is? Because we do. He left. He defected. He's a rogue. But Jesus says that this man was justified. Justification? What, how do we get justice? If something that's ha supposed to happen is happening, what do, we, what do we call it? Probably nothing. It's like, this is the way things go. Yes, yes, yes. But when something bad turns into something good, we call it justice. When something that's not the way it's supposed to be gets flipped and turned into something that it ought to be, whether that's legislation, whether that's something in our hearts, whether that's the policing, whether that's the way we treat one another, whether it's if when we go in and we help people who are in need, we do justice, that means first something was wrong and then was made right. That's justice. Justice is Change. And change is that word metanoia. And that word metanoia is what? Repentance. Go ahead on the last part. After the last comma, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled. Excuse me, not the last comma, the one before last. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Go ahead and just underline the mess out of that or circle that, because that is the crux of the message. But hopefully it will help you remember something. Two men went into a temple, and one walked out different than when he walked in. Jesus' resolve here is not who's righteous. The Pharisee is righteous. Jesus is not making a point to say this is a bad guy. He's saying two men walked into a temple, one on his own strength, and he left the same. One by my strength because he needed me and he left changed. What Jesus is saying is why walk in to the temple if you plan on walking out just like you walked in? That Pharisee still thinks he's better than the tax collector, and he thought that before he walked in. 
The things the Pharisee does, oh my gosh, that's a great list. I'm glad he's none of those things. I'm glad he's not like the tax collector too. But he also walked out still better than the tax collector in his own eyes. Because what? Jesus is talking to who? People who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Jesus is saying, do you see the tax collector? He doesn't trust in himself that he's righteous. He sees his need and decides to change. Jesus isn't mocking these people. I don't think as much as I tried, I, I'm, I'm sure Jesus didn't put on a voice to make the Pharisee sound like more of a jerk than he actually is. He probably told them this, do you hear yourself? Do you hear yourself? Am I making it plain? Am I making it clear that this is what you sound like? And you're walking into the place of change, the place of community, the place of justification, and you are walking out unjustified. But those who come in knowing that they're in need walk out changed. Creator, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that we are not justified by our own strength. But I hope and ask that you would open our eyes to see. God, not to see that we're just awful sinners, but to see the places where we need some adjustment, where we need some repentance. And if the temple's not the place to do it, if the sanctuary is not the place to do it, if the church is not the place to do it, because iron ought to be sharpening iron in this building, not that we walk out perfect, but that we walk out changed, repentful, and justified. Lord, I pray that every meeting we ever have, whether it's over beers at ladies' night or whatever they drink, whether it's over cupcakes after the service, whether it's during the service or the service things that we do in this community, that we always walk away changed. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Oh, I messed up a lot. I messed up a bunch of it. <laughs> you hear yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and two men walk into a temple starts out like a bad joke right two men walk into a temple one walks out different than when he walked in though and that's a wonderful message to hear. And as Brandon pointed out, repentance. That word which is in, in Mark, in chapter 1, verse 15, that first thing that Jesus starts out his, his ministry with is repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And as, as Brandon said, repent means change. And I've got a, you maybe even a better word for you. It means transformation. And we confess our sins to each other and to God because we transform. We look to transform through those things. And speaking of transforming, we're going to transform into even more of a community now as we become the body of Christ. And as anybody who, who happens to be visiting today, just want to remind you that we don't have any rules about membership or about baptism. If you feel like you want to take communion with us, please do. And did everybody get a little cup for communion that wants to take communion? If you did not, please raise your hand. Lori will bring you one. There's one for Colby, one for... Wonderful. And so we gather around the table that Christ himself prepares so that we would know ourselves beloved. And we remember that he lifted bread from the common table. And after he had blessed it and given thanks to God, he broke it. And he shared it with each disciple whom he loved, saying, take this and eat. This is my body broken for you.
Likewise, he took the cup. And again, he offered thanks and praise to God in heaven. And after he had blessed it, he shared it with each disciple whom he loved, saying, take this and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is spilled for the sins of the whole world. Do this as often as you shall in remembrance of me. And so, Jesus, here we are, remembering you and offering our lives as a holy, living sacrifice, made holy not by our own goodness, but by your own almighty power to touch, reclaim, redeem, and transform us even now. We invite you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon your people gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and of juice. Let them be for us spiritual food for our spiritual journey. We ask this, Christ, through your own most precious name, and we dare to pray as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God's table is prepared and we are all invited. So I invite you now to peel back the first layer. And to take the bread and to eat. And to know yourselves beloved. And now, take the cup and to drink deeply of the love that transforms everything. And with love in their hearts, the people of God said, yes, yes, yes. And now, and now, <clears throat> the bread got stuck in Sean's throat now. <clears throat> but now, let us each give as we are able, according to the gifts that God has given us. And, uh, but let us pray now. And gracious God, we're so thankful to you for having these opportunities to be together and for having each other. And we do have some prayers and we really, last week we talked about demanding prayers, God. And we have some demanding prayers. This week we want to pray Jesus' name into Robin, into Mike, into also Mark, who's at home, who is at home after surgery this week. I want to pray healing. Gracious God, we know that you sent Jesus Christ to come here and spent so much of his ministry healing us. We know that that healing continues to this day. We know that that healing can still be here affecting us. And we pray that healing upon everybody that was mentioned today. We also pray for Connie Koble and that you, can, that you can accept her in to your family of saints. God, we have so many great joys this week too. And we, this Holy Spirit's been with us. And we thank you for it being with us here in this building and out in the community. In Christ's name, we pray all these things. Amen.